Parents that create a secure attachment style in their children say different things to their children than parents who unconsciously create an insecure attachment style in their children. I am Pauline and I am so happy you are here because it is important if you are a parent or want to be your parent to know how to create a secure attachment style, of course, but also it is so healing to hear what you should have heard when you were a child. On this channel, we talk all about the healing uh, or the fearful avoidant uh, attachment style and how to heal that attachment style. And so these are five protective things that you should have heard when you were a child from your parents. The first is, that's okay, that happens to all of us. This is something that I hear my mother-in-law say a lot to my daughter when they are babysitting her. Um, and the first time I heard that, I was like, that is so good to grow up with hearing that. That's okay. That happens to all of us. Because one of the things that um, create an, in, an insecure attachment style is that you feel like you are the only one that does this bad thing. That you are the only one that... Uh, that this happens to when your parent gets angry or criticizes or judges you they will never say uh, oh but that just happens to everyone they will always make you feel whether they intend to or not that this is this is different this is not good and you should adapt to how it should be so that you fit in with society because a lot of fearful avoidant parents uh, or insecure attached parents for a lot of those parents, that is what they want, that you fit into society, that they prepare you for the world. And in that, they can tend to uh, make you feel like you are different than others and you have to adapt, you have to change to fit in with society. So that's one that is so powerful and i started using that with myself too <laughs> as soon as i heard my mother-in-law say that i was like when something happens when i feel a feeling that is uncomfortable or when i think i'm being weird i think ah oh, that happens to all of us it's just it feels so good because immediately you feel more connected to other people instead of feeling like the odd one out the only one that has, the, has these feelings or does this weird thing. And you're never the only one. There are too many people on planet Earth to for you to be the only one. So a lot of the things that you think you are the only one in are actually quite universal. And there's a lot of people that, that experience that or that, happen, uh, that have that happen. A second one is this is not your fault. Uh, and that means how you feel or what's happening. Uh, so when, for instance, uh, dad had had a, a, a rough day at work and he's coming home and he's just not happy, secure parents tend to explain to children, dad is a little bit grumpy, isn't he? Yeah, he had a rough day at work. It has nothing to do with you. It's not your fault. And when they themselves um react in a way that they didn't want to they make a point of explaining that to their children this is not your fault mommy is feeling a certain way i have to deal with that this is not this is not you um you and that makes you feel like you are not responsible for the emotions and feelings of your parents which is a complete opposite from what a lot of parents with insecure attachment styles do um which is now you're making daddy mad, da 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 da. You see you're, how you're making mommy sad? They they deliberately make their children feel responsible for the uh, feelings of their parents. And that is just way too big a burden for a child to carry. That is just not fair to put that on a child because we are always responsible for our own emotions and our own feelings. So whenever... Uh, somebody else is unregulated, it can help to to think, okay, this is not my fault. I can see how I can help. I can see how I can just be there for that person. And it could be that I said something that triggered that person, but that doesn't mean that it's my fault and I'm a bad person because that is what is ingrained in children who um, 
or kind of installed or, or concluded by children who hear this a lot like you're making dad mad you're making mom um you're making mom mad or sad that is what a lot of children think like oh i'm a bad person i am causing all these bad emotions in other people because now both of my parents are distressed and apparently it's all my fault so that's just that's such a big burden to um uh to have on your shoulders and children tend to that's just very normal developmentally um tend to think that everything is our fault anyway so when you get divorced as parents especially below the age of 12 children do not have the ability to see the perspective that they are definitely not to blame it's not their fault they will believe that it's their fault that mommy and daddy are getting divorced that if they would have just been better if they would have been more perfect if they wouldn't have been a burden then mommy and daddy wouldn't have gotten divorced that's just how children's brains work so secure parents know that they know how children's brains work usually generally and so they make a point of saying hey what is happening now is not your fault there might be a lot of confusion there might be a lot of emotions there might be a lot of things happening and it's not your fault i don't want you to take responsibility for that and that helps that is very protective for your own mental health for the rest of your life then the third one is, I understand you want this and this and this. So children want things, right? That's just every child, I think, want things, wants things. Whether that's toys, whether that's uh, going outside, not going outside, they want things. And parents who have the tendency to want to have control who believe they have to control their children will just say no you can't have that will use anger to make sure they will stay in control which makes the child uh, feel like whatever they want is not important and they shouldn't want things and this when they grow up can really lead to problems in um not really even feeling their needs or their wants and feeling like what they want just doesn't matter and they will never get it so um acknowledging that it's okay to want things even when you're not getting them can be very protective of their sense of i am allowed to have things i am worthy of wanting things it's just not always possible you know if if a child wants to uh I don't know wants to have a toy that's really expensive and you're just in the store you're you're not going to be able to buy that toy you're not going to want to buy that toy and that's completely fine too and just empathizing with the fact that that's hard for the child that they want something and then they're not getting it but that doesn't mean that you uh, don't put up a boundary so this was just very freeing when i learned this that i could put up a boundary when my child wants something and hold on to that boundary and uh, um, and empathize with the fact that she wants it but isn't getting it. Last night was a, an example of this. She was playing with a lampoon stick. I don't know if you know what I mean, but it was kind of like a stick thing. And she started hitting her dad with it. Uh, and so we took it away because when you hit people with things, you're not ready to have that thing in that moment and so we said we're taking this away you can play with it again tomorrow and she was not having it she wanted to play with that so bad and she cried and she cried and first of all i felt like other stuff was coming out too it wasn't just about that stick it was about the lampoon it wasn't just about the lampoon thing there was uh there was probably a lot she had to process um that came out and if i would have got, given her that lampoon stick back because she so desperately wanted it and my husband was looking at me like oh this is sad can't we give it i'm like no she she's okay crying is okay and all i did was empathize and say i know you want it i know you want it and it's hard that we're not giving it to you and that you have to wait and 
She says, but it's, it takes so long. Tomorrow is so long away. And I'm like, yeah. And then we're going to sleep. And before you know it, it's in the morning. And then you can play with it again. But I knew it would be more confusing for her if I would give it to her while she was processing things. And that it was more protective for her mental health if I would just empathize with her, not get angry at all, just really understand that that's hard. She wanted that and we were taking that away because she wasn't um, handling it with the right responsibility. And it was beautiful because she came to me and she just wanted to hug me. And then afterwards she was so much calmer than she was before. So there were different things playing into this, I think. Um, but she felt heard and she felt understood. Um, and, and in the end she said, so if I don't hit people with the stick, then I can play with the stick as much as I want. I said, yeah, of course, of course you can. So she, I, I, I think that is, um, an example of, of this sentence that I understand you want, I understand you want to play with it and, uh, and you're not getting it right now. And I understand that's hard. I really do. So you can empathize with the reaction instead of also trying to control the reaction. S the fourth thing I was thinking if I, if there's more to say about that, um, but let's go on. The fourth thing is it's okay to make mistakes. It's so important for children to grow up and learn that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to, um, to break things. It's okay to lose things. It's okay to do the wrong thing, to say the wrong thing. Um, so it's okay to make mistakes. And it's also important for children to see you make mistakes and then be okay with that and own up to it and take responsibility responsibility for that. Um, so growing up, learning that it's okay to make mistakes that will be protective in the way that they won't be as afraid of failure. They won't be as afraid to set somebody off. They won't be as afraid to just be themselves in the world because they know that it's okay. They don't have to be perfect. It's okay if they, if they mess up sometime, sometimes and they are still very much worthy of love and, and all the good things in life. And then the fifth thing is the fifth protective thing is, um, when a parent says to a child, I love being with you. So not, you are such a good girl, such a good boy, uh, or um, uh, anything that's focused on performance in any way. Just, I love being with you. You don't have to be anything. You don't have to do anything. I just love being with you. And that's very protective because I think a lot of really well-meaning parents tend to say, uh, oh, that's so good of you. Oh, yay. And just very, um, this is especially American, I think, but I hear it too in, in Holland, in the Netherlands. Um, it's really well intended, but it can lead to the, to the child thinking they always have to do something right in order for their parents to be happy with them. And I want my daughter to know that I just love being with her, even when she's having a temper, even when she's having a really hard day. I almost make a point of saying this even more because I do. I love being with her and I don't care if she's grumpy. I don't care if she's really happy. I don't care if she's having a hard day or not. I love being with her. I love being around her uh, without her having the feeling like she has to be a certain way to, to please me. Um, and I'm not saying these things, I, I try to do all these things. I try to say all these things as much as I can. I'm not saying I'm a perfect parent whatsoever, but it does, it is healing for me to be able to give these things to my child. And it could very well be that I grow and I evolve. And then in five years, I look back and I think, oh, that one sentence, I wouldn't say that anymore. So this is just where I stand right now. And what I notice works with my child. Um, but every child is different also. But I think these are five general protective things that secure parents usually say that can actually help a secure attachment. So um, the reason why that helps 
is that all of these prevent shame and guilt. And shame and guilt are the driving factor for so many mental health issues and addiction. So preventing shame and guilt in your child is really valuable. It's really valuable. So saying that's okay, that happens to all of us, that takes away shame because shame separates you from other people. It makes you feel like you're worse, you're less, you're not good enough to, to be with other people, to connect with other people. Um, and that's why people, when they feel shame, they tend to retreat. And why people who are depressed, who tend to retreat, tend to also have a lot of sh feelings of shame. So hearing that's okay that happens to all of us makes you feel connected even in the moments when you mess up even in the moments when you don't feel good you know i'm not the only one everybody has this so i can just be myself so it prevents shame and this is not your fault prevents guilt i i really believe that if you think you're responsible for your parents feelings and emotions you will feel guilty a lot and uh that's hard for children to to take that on and that could even create in the end a guilt complex if parents deliberately use guilt to make you do this to make you do things so they will uh, uh consistently make you feel like things are your fault so saying to your child this is not your fault or saying to to yourself this is not my fault can take away that guilt you are not responsible for everything and everyone um not responsible for everybody's feelings and emotions not responsible for everything going right in the world you are allowed to let that go and that will also let go of that guilt that is weighing down on you i understand you want something also prevents shame and guilt because if you get angry at a child for reacting to your no no you're not getting that and then don't be a baby, don't be such a uh, whatever drama queen when you get angry that you're not getting what you want. That will create shame also. Like, oh, I'm a bad person for wanting things. It's okay to make mistakes. Definitely prevents shame and guilt. You are allowed to make mistakes. Uh, and I love being with you without you having to perform or do anything for that. Even on your hardest days, that is also a way to prevent shame and guilt because it it it's belonging it's connection even in 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 all um situations so on the bad days on the good days um yeah so preventing shame and guilt i think is one of the most valuable ways to help your child um to help protect your child uh, from mental health issues down the line. And again, I have a three and a half year old. I, I don't know what it's going to be in 20 years or 30 years. She might struggle also, but uh, I always try to find ways to um, prevent shame and guilt in her. So please let me know if this was valuable for you. If you are interested in a little bit more parenting, kind of things. I make these videos really also if you don't have children, you don't want children, um, just because these are the things that you should have heard when you were younger and they can be very healing to hear now uh, and know that, oh, the fact that my parents did it differently doesn't say that I was wrong. It just says that they chose a certain um, style of raising me that didn't really work that well. Um, so that's why I make these videos, but please let me know. Do you want more of these videos? Are you interested in this? Are they valuable to you? Let me know in the comments below. As always, I am so happy you are here and I will see you in the next one. Healed and Happy is a tailor-made online program where me and my team personally guide you through healing the roots of a fearful avoidant attachment style.